I get the honor of introducing our next um, couple. Um, but before I introduce them, I'd like to give you a little orientation to why we have developed a program, and they will then tell you about the program. This is a presentation that doesn't start out with a, a, a first slide of introductions. When I was nine, I would have like these huge temper tantrums, and it became really hard for me to do anything, feeling like there's something wrong with me and that I'm innately flawed um, was part of what I think made it so hard. I mean, I, I was nine and I was contemplating suicide. She was so sad and so hollow and I don't know that you would even be able to fathom that seeing her now. There was nothing there. There was she just basically give it up. <laughs> so this is often what the way families come into our family connections program, filled with pain, with a lot of difficulty in being able to manage what's going on in their lives. We also know though that family members Staying the course with their relative is very important, and we have a study. Somehow the slides got a little confused here, so I won't worry about them. Um, we, we did a study about 12 years ago on a construct called expressed emotion, and what that study showed was, contrary to any other psychiatric diagnosis, that the more emotionally involved family members stay the course with their relative, the better the patient or the relative fares over a one-year time span. That was what the research showed. So given what families go through and the fact that things are very difficult, they're worrying about suicide, they're worrying about self-injury, and on the other hand, their emotional involvement is crucial for their relative, we realized that we needed to come up with some sort of program to help family members stay the course with their relative. So what you'll be hearing today is um, about our Family Connections program. This is a program that we now have in 16 countries. We have had um, maybe three, four, 5,000 people who have gone through the program over its 12-year existence. We have a wait list that's so long, I'm embarrassed to tell you how many people are probably on it. But it is a course that works and has changed the lives of family members, and we believe in the long run also changes the lives of the person with BPD. Research showed that actually the levels of burden, grief, and depression go down when family members attend the course and equally important, their sense of empowerment goes up, meaning that from the skills that they've learned, they're able to manage situations in a much more effective way. It's now my pleasure to turn over this part of the program to Anne and Matt Costello. These are a um, married couple with three children. They will tell you their story. But they're exemplary in being family connections leaders. I don't even know how many times they've run this course probably maybe a dozen, 15 times. It's a 12-week course. When they finish the course, the next Sunday they start over again. And each week they're in White Plains running the course um, for family members. They also run support groups. They're incredible. And they really show what families can do and families make a di can make a difference. We also have other family members out here today who are also Family Connections leaders. So we want to share with you the program, hope that maybe if you're a family member or you work with families, you can think to have them attend the program. We also do it by telephone, so it's all over this country and as well as other countries, as I said. So it's my pleasure to introduce Matt and Ann Costello. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our presentation. Thrilled to see so many of you still here, because uh, I know I need a nap. Uh, I'll be, we'll be using notes because Believe it or not, this is the first time we've spoken at Yale, so uh, that's why we'll be referring to notes. Um, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we're going to do, and we'll go back and forth, and then we'll do it, and when it's done, it'll be over. It'll be done. <laughs> <coughs> it's nice things out there. They do come to an end point. Um, uh, we're parents of uh, children who deal with all, not all, many of the things that we've been talking about today on a daily basis. On a daily basis, we interact with them 
dealing with those things we've been talking about every day. Uh, we're, uh, Anne's a teacher. She works K to six in her school, K to five maybe. Uh, I'm a writer. Uh, we're on the NEA, NEA BPD board and we do our best there to serve as much as possible. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to mirror what's, what it's like to go inside a Family Connections course. Um, so there'll be some redundancies. So you may say, oh, we heard that already. But we're just trying to mirror what the experience is for uh, parental units not always parental units, but often parental units who uh, come into the Family Connections class. Uh, we've been doing the course for four years. As Perry mentioned, we do three a year. Uh, we do it in New York Presbyterian White Plains. Um, a lot of luminaries, this portraits of Otto Kernberg and other people on the wall, they look down at us. They seem okay. They're not, they don't seem terribly displeased with us so far. Not judgmental, well, of who uh, you'd expect them not to be. Uh, once, a, once a month, uh, we do a support group of alumni, and lately we've been getting 40, 45 people coming to that for a little skills review. Uh, we have guest speakers uh, coming to do that. Uh, our background, obviously we're not clinicians, not researchers, uh, we've been to three trainings run by Perry and Allen uh, and NEA BPD. Uh, we've also gone to a behavioral tech training that was done in Greenwich a year or so ago with Adam Miller, no, Adam Payne and Alec Payne Miller. And uh, we went to the NASSPD conference in Boston, brain and behavior conferences in New York. We try to get as much information as possible because we specifically are not trained. And then we try not to go beyond our role, which is not to be therapists, but stick to the skills that are relevant to working with parents. Uh, and that's what we do. Right, um, it's, that's a key word is we're not therapists. And um, as time goes by, parents be begin to believe that we're therapists. And we have to always go back to the skills. Um, we do a free 12 week class, two hours um, every Sunday morning. We ask for a very small donation that goes to NEA BPD. Um, it's m manualized. Uh, in other words, um, it's a big, fat manual that we use from, it gets fatter and fatter as I collect more information, um, that Perry and Alan Fazzetti, Perry Hoffman and Alan Fazzetti put together. Um, it's a curriculum. It's an actual curriculum, and we get through the, the six modules in 12 weeks. Um, we're a little behind this year because we had some interesting weather all year. So it took us, we had to cancel some because we had some interesting Sundays. Um, we give current information. Um, I'm always on the NEA BPD uh, website. I send them everything. Um, they listen in on the, the uh, talks that are on Sunday night that are wonderful. Um, we give them the symptoms. And I was going to go through the criteria, but that was done earlier. So you know the criteria, but our family members don't always know them. So we go through them and we elaborate on them, um, such as what would be um, the, the cutting and pulling of hair and all kinds of things that they do. Um, we have two children who have borderline, by the way. Um, our oldest child just had a baby himself, so he's in good shape. Um, we uh, go to all the NEA BPD um, uh, functions that we have. Uh, we go to lots of conferences. Um, with the family member, we continue to give them skills. The skills come later. We start with information, but we give them skills later. Um, sharing, we do sharing. Um, we, and I'll, I'll get to that of how we do the first day sharing. And we always do an activity so that they can meet each other and they can meet other families and they get to talk about things that um, we give them a, a, something to talk about, like, oh, that's a good title for a song. Uh, the, um, we'll, like for instance, we would say, uh, is there something you can't validate right now? Or is there something you haven't validated that you'd like to validate? And then we give them a couple of minutes and they share and then they come back to the group. Um, let's see, we get um, our families come, no, that's coming later. Uh, let's see. We teach the families the language that the um, clients get, that their children and their loved ones get if they're taking DBT. Um, so our classic one in our house is um, when our son wants something, he'll say, can I do a deer man on you? And so <laughs> we, all, we know what he's talking about. And we'll do a deer man on him too. And, and we do it with love and joy, and we laugh about it. Um, we keep it light. Um, the, fam this, this fam the Family Connections is actually complementary to whatever DBT 
um, family members get on their own. The difference is that um, after our, our loved ones go to therapy, they come home. And we have them seven days a week, and only one hour they're in therapy. So the Family Connections teaches the families how to remain calm, how to have the skills that they need in order to keep things calm, and to be complementary to whatever kind of therapy they're getting. Okay? So how do people find the program? How do they find the program? Um, they go through this wonderful manager we have that has been um, a virtual manager for me for a long time, uh, Kim Illowit, who's sitting right there. She's our manager. Um, they go to neabpd.com, um, and there's a space there for families. And they click on families, and it's a drop-down menu, and it says families register. So Kim gets all the registrations, and it always has their address, their state, their zip codes, their phone numbers, and things of that sort. So when I want to start a new group, I will get in touch with Kim, and Kim sends me downstate New York, a little bit of Connecticut, and a little bit of New Jersey. And we get the Bronx and Queens and Manhattan and Brooklyn and all of that. We get a, a lot of them. Um, the registration goes uh, all around the world uh, through Canada and different countries. It's, it's pretty amazing, and she's wonderful. Um, okay. We, off, we often get people from word of mouth. We get family members who graduate from our group, and then they go and tell other family members. And so they call me, usually they'll call me, and I'll say, register on uh, the website and type in that you've spoken to Ann Costello, that Matt and Ann, and Kim gets that and she sees that they've already spoken to me, but they've, always, they've already registered. We put flyers out, um, usually about three or four weeks before we start, and we put them in therapy centers, we put them at the train station, we put them in the hospital, we put them at the A&P, where else? We put them... Anywhere there's a bulletin board. Anywhere there's a bulletin board, we'll put them up. Uh, we put an article in the newspaper. Um, our local newspaper guy, he's always asking, you know, can, can you give us an update? So that's where they come from. So who are the people that walk in um, to this room with all these portraits in there? Um, they come from all walks of life. We get between 20 to 25 people, which is, which is a lot. I think, I think Perry tends to think 12 to 14 is optimum, but we kind of believe how do you say no to someone who is in desperate straits. And we were talking to people from Clearview and Silver Hill about the need to get a parent into a group right away. And often you say, you know, say, I'm in crisis right now. Well, wait two months. Well, we're starting a group in two months, and it's okay. You know, so, so we do take people when they're there. Uh, one thing they share in common is that they've all suffered stigma. Many of them, most of them, have thought they've been the only person on the block suffering from this. They felt ashamed. They felt guilty. Everyone else is going to Harvard. That, this kid's going to be an astronaut. This one's going to discover a cure for something, and I have this. So they think they're alone. So they walk into this room, and there are all these other people. I thought it sounded like Jerry Seinfeld there. There are all these all other these people, people. <laughs> uh, in the room uh, who share the same. And all of a sudden, from that first moment, a bit of, if, if nothing else happened, a bit of that stigma disappears because they're not alone. And even more so into the support group, when they, they, we know we've had 250 people over the past couple of years, and 40 or 50 show up at one of those. The other thing is they're couples, usually couples. Sometimes it's a single parent. Sometimes one parent comes and the other's reluctant. We've actually had one parent come in the next course, the other yeah. parent shows up, and that's <laughs> fine. Uh, sometimes it's siblings. Once in a while, it's a spouse. Um, and occasionally it's been where they've had adult parents in their 50s, 60s, 70s, that they've been dealing with this all their life. Um, though most often we're looking at 18 to 30 year old offspring. Uh, the one thing they, we also tell them at the beginning is we say to them that you and your loved ones are all heroes. Why, and you know, they just walk in the room feeling stigmatized. So why are you heroes? Because you and your loved one are both dealing with something that most people on the planet don't have to deal with it, and you're here. And you know whether it's climbing Everest or diving down to the bottom of the ocean, that certainly is heroic. So, and we kind of reinforce that as we go along. Okay, so the first day they come in, um, they're very shy. Everything's very quiet. Um, prior to their arrival, I send them an email, and I send them um, the the attachment for module one. So they get the module one on their computer and they print it out. I ask them to print it out. I also ask them to write a little paragraph 
Um, have, did I do that with you guys? A little paragraph, right, Nancy? Did I? Yeah, we did paragraphs. We don't always do it. Um, uh, they come prepared, in other words, to talk about their family um, because sometimes it's very hard to keep them um, brief, especially when you have 24 people there. Do the math. We have two hours, and if they're each doing three minutes, um, the day is over. So we, we do have management skills. We're able to manage it. And um, I asked them to give me the, uh, the first name of their loved one, their age, um, and what their current living situation is. Because somebody before mentioned, I think it was Lois, about um, if they're at home or if they're somewhere else. Okay, because it's, sometimes it's a, it can be easier and you can reconnect and reattach if they're not living in your house. Uh, we also ask them to mention to us uh, what is the most upsetting symptom for yourself and what is the most upsetting symptom for your loved one. And they bring that on the card and they each get a chance to talk and we go around and we share. And then um, if and we tell them that we're probably going to have to cut you off if you go too long. Please don't be insulted. We all have everybody else to do it. So I ask them, when I say, oh, can you give me a stress number at this point, they'll give me a stress number. And the stress numbers are 1 to 10. Uh, 1, you have nothing on your plate. Everything's fine. 10, you are way overdue. It's way over. And we get some people come in and say, well, I'm 25. You know. So um, that's the stress. And then we go on to the next person. If I'm moving this too fast, let me know. I'm just trying to. No, no. it's not moving. No, this, 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 this way, this way. No, it's not moving. You said left, right. Okay, never mind. Um, never mind. Okay, so um, the next slide would say early days. Uh, so in the early days, just people process. people arrive and they, unlike everybody here probably now, they maybe have heard the words borderline personality disorder, maybe heard the letters DBT. Other than that, they really know nothing. So educating them to uh, that it's an emotional dysregulation disorder is key. We talk about, and again, we don't step out of our comfort zone in terms of um, what we know, but we say it's a bi the biosocial theory of the disorder, which is there's a genetic component, and there's a... And there's a Thank social you. component, namely the environment, the invalidating environment. Uh, we also discuss how it's transactional. In other words, it's not this person here who's acting this way. It's a dynamic that goes back and forth. And where possible, we bring in things that we've learned in other conferences that sort of show that this is not someone who's just getting angry and breaking windows because they like to get angry and break windows. There's something going on here. And gradually get them to the point where they accept the fact that it is indeed a disorder. So uh, understanding the symptoms, that's exactly what Matthew is saying, that they're not somebody who's just breaking things, though it appears that way. Um, and anger is not always uh, in the, the borderline personality disorder um, criteria. Uh, we, have, we do have some families that they don't have anger, though a good many, many of them do. And we try to get them to understand um, in many, many different ways. We do lots of different um, brain scans, we show them the brain scans that we get, that it's a, it's a chemical reaction and they don't want to be doing this as much as you don't want them to be doing it. And we teach them how to understand these symptoms and then we talk about before the skills, so comorbidity. Right, so co uh, we talk about the comorbidity and co-occurring disorders, like what, what will occur with borderline personality disorder, whether it's uh, certain aspects of anorexia, uh, whether it's uh, narcissism, major, ma major depressive disorder, because the, they're going to walk in and no single person is going to have the same exact person. But we say, how many of your kids have trouble sleeping? Hands go up. All the hands go up. How, many, how many of your kids have been kicked out of school? Hands go up. How many have had volatile relationships? So they start to see this little web of connections. Even though each one, and that's why they're one, I, I thought when Lois was talking, they're really interesting because they're unique. And they're hypersensitive. In some ways, that's an amazingly good thing. And also, other disorders, people who have other diagnoses, whether it's bipolar, where they have certain borderline features. And we talk about that. We talk about the primary diagnosis would be, for example, um, major depressive disorder, certain borderline features. So, and we have the percentages which have been come through research that we pass on to them. Right. 
Um, why the information before the skills? Well, because it's in the book that way, for starters. But <laughs> Alan always says you can, you can pick and choose, and you can kind of move it around. But we're very comfortable with this, because we've done it so many times, that we go through all of the information first. And we tell them that it's information heavy. And then when the skills come, we all get very excited. Um, we actually weave the skills in all the time. We always talk about validation. We always talk, talk about judgment. But um, if you understand the symptoms and if you understand what's going on, you can have empathy. And you can change. And empathy and change can come slowly. Um, the, this, as Perry said, it does reduce uh, grief, guilt, burden um, if you've completed the class. And that's why we do the skills later. And it gets them coming back, too. <laughs> so one, one thing we do, and we actually learned this from the people who we did our class with, which is Marie Paul de Valdivia and Louise Stix, um, had a card for us. Uh, one side of the card is the rights of relatives. Uh, a lot of the people walking in the room, they have lost all rights. They've, they've basically, they don't know what they have. So to give them some sense of this is your life too. There are two people living this life. But the other, car, other side I want to mention just briefly, which is the basic assumptions. Because they walk out of that first session with these basic assumptions, which are to look at things to take the most benign assumption possible. So if you look at behavior, someone's in your face, cursing full stream. Their normal reaction is, what's the normal reaction going to be? And we say, what's the benign assumption reaction? The benign assumption reaction is going to be, this person is extremely dysregulated now. They're extremely upset. And ignore, not ignore all the F-bombs, but look at, and that assumption is possible. And that's another thing to emphasize. And the second assumption is there's no one or one absolute truth. We all got a bit of, and it's like that Japanese movie, Rashomon, where there's many different, you're seeing different slices of things happening. Everyone's, you're all having a different experience here now. Some people are interested, some people, you know, some people believing, whatever. There's different experiences going on. Everyone has this different slice of what's going on. Um, at the risk of being shameless, <laughs> No, it's OK. <laughs> so imagine that this is your loved one in crisis. The risk is oh. oh, he can't hold the mic. Here, stand here. This will be interesting. No, stand here. How about my lovely assistant? <laughs> uh, so imagine this is, this is the crisis. This is the car wrapped around the tree and the vodka bottles in the yard, the ambulance right there, police at the door. Get the picture? OK? And that's what you're seeing. Right? But that's only part of it. Because if you keep your eye on only one thing, you're going to miss everything a else. lot of every other thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing two shows, two shows a night at the uh, end <laughs> there. Uh, so so we, we try to say that even in the moment of the car wrapped down the tree and the vodka bottles and, and the police and everything, there's a lot to take in. There's a lot to see there, and the policeman will have it there, their truth, your loved one will. And the last one is, well, the last two is, everyone's doing the best they can in the moment. Make that assumption, because it'll keep you regulated. Even if it doesn't look very pretty, if you go in with the assumption that's the best they can do at this moment, just think how that keeps you regulated. And then the corollary of that, if I said that word correctly, is everyone needs to try harder or keep trying. So right now, that's the best we can do. And let's go forward and explore how we can do better. We have a lot of parents who come in and say, well, we're done. We've had enough. This is it. And they say, well, you're here. And that's good. And they stay. They go through it. Um, OK, the core teaching skills. Right. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think I'm doing primary emotions. Yeah. So again, I won't belabor this, but many people come in. They're angry at their loved one. They're angry at themselves. There's a lot of there's a lot of anger first session in that room, and what we try to show them is, anger feeds off judgment, and it feeds off other emotions. For example, let's say your loved one isn't responding to your call. Where are you? It's 3 a.m., 2 a.m. You're worried. You have fear. You're scared. 
Those are all primary emotions. And they're adaptive because you can actually use them later to, to work out. But what happens for most people when the person finally comes in that door at 3 a.m., boom, anger. So, and people struggle with this. So we, we spend time brainstorming all the primary emotions. What are they? Uh, and say you really need, you know, you can't, it's like, it's like in being a race car. You can't speed past them. You gotta slow it down, come back to what was at that core. If a stranger walked in your door at 3 a.m., you wouldn't, wouldn't care. It's the fact that this is a loved one, someone you care about. Right. Um, validation is the next one that we do, and um, a lot of them have never heard about validation. They don't know anything about validation, but um, it has to be done non-judgmentally. Um, validation is fe you can validate feelings. You can validate emotions. A lot of them think that the family member perceives that as agreeing with them that um, they're going to stay out all night. And you say, well, I see you. You'd like to stay out till 3 o'clock. Yeah, OK, bye. And they go. And um, it's not, it doesn't mean that you agree with them. You're simply using validation statements. We write down, we have a list of maybe 50 or 60 validation statements that I've gotten from Alan, and I've gotten from Perry, and I've gotten from Marie Paul, and I've gotten them from all of our family members. And um, I send that to them. They all have that. And we've actually had family members tell us they put the validation right in their pocket. And when it's one, another one is taped right where the phone is. So when the phone calls come, they can validate. Because it's not intuitive. This program is not intuitive. It's, it's not how we were raised. Um, and if we continue to raise our children the way I was raised, <laughs> which was not so good, um, that you can't, you can't help your borderline. So you, the parents have to change. The family members, they're not always just parents, but the family members have to change how they respond to their loved ones. And validation, as somebody said that before, is the core of the program. Validation. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to rush through the, the, the next one. Observing limits. Uh, some people arrive, and they, they've not ever... Uh, at least recently been able to have limits or know what limits are. They're sort of in the sea floating along. So we teach them to identify limits in their own life that, that they can turn themselves into a rock, that the word no can be said with gentleness and love. It's said thoughtfully. And that finding your limits, even if you don't know what to do about it, let's say a situation you don't know what to do about it, saying this exceeds my limits, at least plants a flag for who you are, what your values are, and, it's going to, and your loved one's going to know you have those values. So it's a little, a little turn that people have to make to, to sort of regain the fact I can have a limit. And it's different from setting boundaries. It's not putting a fence around the person. You're identifying what you can do. Right. You can't make them do anything, but you can decide what you want to do. Our children now know when they call up and ask for something, say, I know you have to talk to dad. And we always say, I'm, I want time to think about it. That's also a key thing that we tell our families. Take time to think. You don't have to answer right away. Um, the next one is mindfulness. And I think we all know about mindfulness. Our family members don't really know about it. But teaching them is a true gift. Um, it's paying t attention. It's really paying attention and cutting out all of the, the um, ambient noise and all the sounds and really listening to them of what they're saying. And sometimes you don't even have to say anything. All you have to do is listen. Um, we are very big on, on um, meditation. And of course, you can do the uh, meditation that uh, Deepak Chopra just did. He did the 21-day meditation. But we have one that we send our families. It's called um, getsomeheadspace.com. And it's a lovely British fellow who talks. And he teaches you how to acknowledge the fact that you're having a thought and you're, it's interrupting. And you just pass it off and go back to your breathing. And that's what I liked about his, his uh, program. It's getsomeheadspace.com. Um, that's mindfulness. Yeah. So a radic radical acceptance. Uh, the confusion with radical acceptance is people can view it as uh, I'm approving something or I'm resigned. And we say, no, radical acceptance. And, and this is tricky. We keep coming back to it, dealing with it. You need to go over and over again. Radical acceptance simply means you accept that this is reality. This is the universe. The asteroid has hit the planet, and the dinosaurs are gone. We've hit an iceberg. And now, how do we go forward from here? Only with radical acceptance, um, I think we've come to believe, only when you do that can you actually start looking at change, when you look at reality. Uh, and people have said things like, I don't know how to accept that. How do I, how do I accept that? And the simple answer, maybe it's too glib, is, well, if that's the reality, then that's the reality. 
And then we teach, you know, about going out and looking at the sky and saying, okay, universe, you're, you know, the universe makes its own rules and whatever happens, happens. Right. Um, struggles. These are struggles that our family members often have when they come in. Um, they struggle with anger. They're still angry. They're angry at their, their loved ones. Um, the loved ones are angry at them. And it's, it's Matthew does our little transactional dance that we did, that, that somebody did up there before, the, the transaction between the two of them, how you affect the others. Um, anger, according to Alan Frazetti, is um, toxic to the, border line, to the borderline. It's too spicy. And anger has no place in a family environment. You're welcome, Alan. <laughs> They, they struggle with the limits idea, um, essentially because, let's say things are going well, they can get lulled in the sense that everything's okay, and then when things aren't okay, they have to re-embrace, they have to accept the fact that, you know, there's going to be times that things are working well and times that things aren't working well. So these are the things they wrestle, and we spend a lot of time, we try not to rush past, we, we welcome when people challenge us on these things because it's important that we really pick it apart and see how it's working. Right. Uh, change. Um, it is very hard for families to change. And they, they feel, why do I have to change? I'm not the one with the problem. They're the one with the problem. I don't have a problem. And we say, well, actually, um, it's that transactional dance again, where you ha they have a problem and you're making it worse or you're not paying attention. So they do have to change. And uh, unbelievably, the family members do change after 12 weeks of uh, a lot of support, a lot of information, and a lot of skills, and they do. And um, there, there was one, I will tell you, quick family, is that the one that I was going to do? No, that's practice, okay, that's really funny. I have a funny story. With acceptance, they, they'll, they'll wrestle with acceptance. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have activities, we'll say, can you identify something you've radically accepted? And then at the same time, can you identify something that you're still struggling to radically accept? Um, so that they keep re-engaging uh, with that. And we do the same thing. We do the activity at the same time because there's things we right. radically it's accept. Right. It's true. It's true. Um, making sense of it all. And after pra uh, 12 weeks, we tell them to practice on the little things, like going into the grocery store. And uh, oh, no, my favorite one is going to Macy's, and I'm returning something. And the girl's on the telephone. And I'm standing there, and I have to get this thing returned. And she's on the telephone. And now, in previous days, I'd start to get the knots in my stomach. I'd say, oh, my god. This is driving me nuts. But um, I've learned now to benignly assume that she's talking to an old friend, somebody she hasn't seen in a while. And it calms me down. And as we know, you get more bees with honey. And I go, I hope everything is OK. And it's practice. <laughs> It's practice, and we tell them to do the practice all the time. And we also help them to um, try to stop being disappointed all the time. Our family members get disappointed that things aren't working or, or it didn't happen, or my, my child did the same thing over and over again, and I just can't make them stop. Well, they, they can stop being disappointed because now you can radically accept that this is how your loved one is, and then you can stop being disappointed and stop being surprised. Who's it, Homer Simpson bangs his head, goes yeah. out, out, out all the time. Um, he just keeps hitting his head. And we teach them skills so that you're not surprised and you're not disappointed in your loved one, and you're remaining much calmer. You're always calm. We always say we're 50% of the relationship with our children, with our loved ones, and we're the ones who are in control. Potentially. We're in control. Right. Potentially. We would like to, to be. A little on the fly, edit. We have, I think we have about tops five minutes. And what do okay. we have? Just do this one slide here. We'll run through it in the order we Trying have. Trying the skills out? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I just said uh, yeah. practice on the small things. From but the, the quick story is we had a family member who um, he, he was not into anything. He was done. He was done. And, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. He was done. Well, I had to show my arms. And he said, my daughter wants to, it's February, she wants to take the car, his brand new Cherokee Laredo, and drive up to Vermont. And he's going, oh my God. And he's, he's been in the class now eight times, and his wife is not home, and he doesn't know what to do, and he's, he's done. So he says, I'm going to have to talk it over with your mom. Um, I'm going to need some time to think. So I said, so what happened? He said, nothing. She said, okay. And he tried it, and it worked. He, he didn't scream and yell at her, what? I'm not giving you that car. He, and he was done. 
He's not done anymore. <laughs> it was great. Second, um, okay. Second one, the importance of practice and small things. Before we do our group, I read some from Thich Nhat Hanh. I hope you know him. And Thich Nhat Hanh says, when you make a cup of tea, make a cup of tea. So being, being very, you know, if you're going to be mindful, to be mindful in a situation that could be dire or a situation that's crisis, you probably should be practicing when you're making a cup of tea. And someone says, oh, look, it's a full moon. Stop, turn, seriously, turn take in the moon. Be mindful in that moment. Well, and then when I, I love what Stacy did. She said, oh, water, and it's cold. Yeah. She was mindful <laughs> that the, mo the water was cold. It's like for, for the moment, the pr your presentation disappeared, and you said, right. cold, cold water. And mm. one can appreciate it. Right. Little mm. small things, right? Um, so role playing. We do a lot of role playing. A lot of the role playing is organic. Um, a family member will say, um, I need to do this. How do I get her to do this? And so we'll stop and we'll role play with the family member. So we'll just do a quick one here. Um, uh, Dad, I need the car keys right now. Really? Uh, uh, the car? What I need I, the car. What I, for? I'm just I curious. have to go to the pharmacy. If I don't pick up those pills, they're just going to be gone. What, I, uh, you need some pill? What medicine? I need or? my meds. I need my vitamins. Okay. I, I oh, need some wow. shampoo. What, I have a lot what of things. What medications are you out of? Just well, you know my meds. Well, you're out of all of them? No, oh. I'm out of some of them. Okay. Um, but well, I, you know, I need the car. You no, know, that's important. You really should have your medication. Um, yeah. Your mom and I have spoken, and, and the car is really not available. But I do. I knew it. I, I, I think that, you know, getting your medication, I'd be glad to take you down when I finish filling the dishwasher. Okay. All right, look, um, I'll help you finish the dishwasher. Can we just go, go out, just do okay, this? We'll okay, we'll do that. Three. And we would do something like that. He didn't make it worse. So I mean, a, li a little, the you know, there's only a couple of skills there. A little fact checking. Yeah. A little validation. I'm getting that she's agitated by it. Uh, and then a little problem solving. Can't always problem solve, right. to be sure. Uh, let's see. Sharing things, sharing, sharing successes. We do that in small groups. We get, I give them a, they get a, a, a card that says what, something that's going to do, like the radical acceptance or the validation, and they share in small groups. Sometimes we have groups of two, sometimes we have groups of three, and then they come back and talk. I know we're getting the, we're getting the boot here. Yes, I know. For the, uh, uh, for, the, for the last item, when things don't work, uh, this doesn't work all the time. This does not work all the time. And what we say is that I'm not big on sports metaphors, but you, you know, you're, you're trying to have a win-win and you want to have a winning season. So you can blow a game. You can lose your temper. Things can not go well. And you don't do should have. I should have done this. I could have done this. We don't have time machines. What you can do is you can analyze what happened and say, OK, next time, maybe have a script, plan out ahead, similar situation about the car comes, plan for the next time and try to build a sense that you're, as I said, having a winning season, even though I don't do sports metaphors. Right. We're not going to do this slide because I think we are, in fact, out of time, right? Are we? Um, okay. But uh, thank you for listening. Oh, oh, wait. You have no. thanks. You have to I give. I have a lot of people to thank here. Okay. I have Perry Hoffman to thank. I have Alan Frazetti to thank. I have Mari Paul Divya to thank. I have Louise Sticks, who's not here. We have way up there. Are you still there, Trish? No. Trish is somewhere. And all of our family members who are here today, thank you very much. Yeah. And Kim Illowit, who's always there for us. Okay? So thank you. <laughs>